Good morning. Welcome to God's house here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church today. Uh, it's great to have this chance to be with you and gather around God's word together. Uh, so welcome to all of you here and welcome to those viewing us online also. Today we are continuing our um, The Bread of Life series uh, that we talked about last week where Jesus says he is the bread of life. And now we, we think about how God feeds us with the bread of life and what he usually uses is, is God's word. And so today we're talking about the importance of God's Word. Uh, we're encur- being encouraged to grow in God's Word. And we're thinking about Christian education, uh, particularly here as, at Good Shepherd. We're getting ready for our school, uh, new school year to start tomorrow uh, with our um, Lutheran Elementary School. So we're excited about that. And uh, we're excited to think about and, and continue to be encouraged to stay in God's Word and have God build us up in our faith through that word. So that'll be the focus of our worship today. We'll begin then with our opening hymn. Please stand. For our service today, we follow the service setting three. Uh, It's page 188 in the hymnal, and it's also in the worship folder you have and on the screen behind me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, 
our gracious Father in heaven, has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have committed to your church the task of making disciples of all nations. Enlighten with your wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship and serve you from generation to generation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And you may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, first of all, from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6. And here we, we see God command his Old Testament people to keep the word close to them. And for us, some unusual things, not only talking about it with your children, but he talks about tying it on your hands and binding it to your foreheads and writing it on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And, and many people did this literally. Um, in, in, among God's Old Testament people. But the idea for us is to, to keep the word something that we have everywhere in our lives, um, to saturate our lives with that word so that we keep seeing that good news of what our God has done for us. So we read from Deuteronomy 6. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The word of the Lord. And our second reading is from the Apostle Paul's second letter to Timothy, uh, chapter 3, and this will also serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word of the Lord. And I invite you to please stand for the gospel. Our gospel for today is from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 18. And here we see Jesus welcoming little children to him. And it's a reminder not just to be polite or welcoming in general to little children, but that this most precious thing that we have, God's word and the good news of Jesus, that's what we want to pass on to children also. And what a blessing it is to do so. So we read from Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. The Gospel of the Lord. We'll continue with our next hymn. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, uh, earlier this weekend I got to help move my oldest into her uh, college dorm room and for another year of school. And as part of this, I got to do one of those tasks that all adults really look forward to, and that is uh, to, whoops, I gotta turn this on. That is to put together various small pieces of furniture by following directions in a little, little booklet. Now, if you've done this before, you, you get this. Um, usually the directions are fairly clear, right? And, and you know, the step one clearly follows, you know, you know, leads into step two, and it all makes sense. Um, there are tricky ones. Um, thankfully, I didn't have much. There weren't, wasn't, there's just a small little side table to put together yesterday, but, uh, or a couple days ago. And, uh, but maybe you've seen some of these are from, I believe, Ikea, where they, there's never any words. It's just pictures and these little strange people that are putting things together. And uh, again, it can be tricky to follow these things. Here's the thing, though. Once you put it together and you have, you know, whatever it is you're making, you don't need to keep that booklet around. Like, for example, um, we did have an Ikea uh, bookshelf in our house at one point. This is from a couple years ago. And, I, and we put it together, and we still have a bookshelf. It's not this one, but sort of like this. Um, I have never, you know, kept that book and then, you know, occasionally walk up to the bookshelf and think, huh, am I, am I enjoying this bookshelf properly? And, you know, page through the little manual? No, I have not looked at it. We, we put the manual aside, and it's, we threw it away, I think. Uh, it's gone, right? Because, yeah, we used it to learn, and, and then we had the thing we needed, and we didn't need the manual anymore, All right? Okay, now, with that in mind, school is starting, at, you know, at least here at Good Shepherd this week, although public schools will start not too far away um, into September, because Labor Day is very early this year. Uh, but, you know, one of the things you think of at school is, you know, books to learn to read. And I remember uh, reading some of these with my kids, even before they kind of got into school. Um, there are these little books, they're called Bob Books. Um, and they're really cute. Uh, and, like, really, really small sentences, you know, two word sentences, uh, kind of in these books. And it was, you know, some of the first books, you know, with my kids that, hey, they could read this on their own. And it was pretty neat. Um, but here's the thing. As they've gotten older, they don't grab the Bob books anymore, right? They've, they've learned from them. Uh, and, and I, you know, um, unless I'm reading to a small child, I'm not going to grab a Bob book and just kind of page through it for my own enjoyment, right? It, it served its purpose, and then we've moved on, right? Even something like a math book, right? Uh, you've got to learn these things, right? And in school, it's important to have these textbooks to learn different mathematical concepts. But, you know, usually you have to give the book back at the end of the school year because it, you know, make, will be used for future students. But even if you kept it, again, I don't think for the rest of your life you'd be, you know, how does subtraction work again? You know, opening a, a math textbook. Because, no, you, you use it for what it's for and then you move on, right? You see where I'm going with this, right? Because we're talking about God's Word, the Bible, um, it's possible there's been a, a translation update since I was a kid. But for the most part, when I was a kid in school, I had a Bible, you know, pretty much like this, pretty much like the Bible that's in the pews um, here in church. And I, would, I, I had it in school, um, at a school very similar to, to Good Shepherds. Uh, or, or even, you know, someone at a, at a Sunday school or a, a faith night kind of thing. They're using the Bible. Right? And yes, for sometimes for children, they're simplified Bibles, but for the most part, it's the same Bible. But that one, of course, the, our, the whole purpose of our service today is to say, well, we want to keep using this. This isn't something that we, okay, we finish whatever the project is, all right, get through grade school or confirmation or, you know, study a specific portion of it, and then you put it aside, and then you go on with your life. No, in this case, you continue in it. So what's the difference? Right? What, is the, what is the big difference with the Bible, uh, God's Word, compared to all those other things? That's what we're going to think about today. And that's, hopefully we get that encouragement you know, in Jesus, our bread of life, who gives us that Word, 
have that encouragement to stay in the word, to not have it be something that, okay, you finish your task and then you put it aside, but you stay in it because God has something continuing to be in that word for you, regardless of your age, regardless of your level of schooling or how much you have done or don't have done in your time of school. God's word is useful for you and it's important for you. So we see that in that second uh, reading that we had looked at, uh, the Apostle Paul's second letter to, Tim- to Timothy. Again, this is the very first verse. Uh, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. Now this is uh, the Apostle Paul writing, like I said, to Timothy, which maybe that name doesn't mean much, but uh, Timothy was a young pastor, basically at this point, that Paul had taught and that Paul had kind of trained And now Paul, uh, you know, as he's writing 2 Timothy, Paul is most likely in prison, and he's writing to encourage Timothy. Uh, Now now he starts here, again, it seems like in the middle middle of something, you know, not the beginning of something, and that's because this is a letter, right? And we're just, we're taking a small part of it. But just to see the verses that came before to kind of get the context here for us, a couple verses before this, he says, in fact... Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So he kind of brings up some sort of some bad news, right? Uh, as a believer, he says you're going to be persecuted, and especially, you know, we think of, again, Paul's writing from prison, so he knows from great experience, and then he's saying, yeah, and there's, and there's evildoers, there's people who who want nothing to do with, with Jesus or, or his word, and there's bad stuff going on. But then, he, then our section start. but as for you, Timothy, that's what, so he's, he's saying, okay, there's that bad stuff going on, but here's what you need to think about. And so this works for us even though, you know, I might be a pastor, but I'm not a pastor serving at the time and place that Timothy was, right? So very different time and place for all of us. But the things that he tells Timothy hold true for us. And uh, we're going to see how important the, the, words is, the, the words he mentions are because it really reminds us of what that means that we're staying in God's word. So again, so he's, but as for you, you know, despite all that bad stuff going, on, going around all over, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. So we know because we've read the whole thing, right, that he's talking about continuing in what he's learned as, as a believer, as a Christian. He's not talking about, you know, some hobby or something. He's talking about his life as a Christian. And he says, you know those from whom you learned it. Now, um, we have a couple of letters to Timothy, so we have a little bit of background on him. So we know for with Timothy, um, we hear that he learned a lot of God's word from his mother and his grandmother. Um, I believe his mother Lois, or his mother Eunice and grandmother Lois, or Eunice and Lois might be switched there. Uh, one's the grandmother and one's the, the mother. But all right, so he had learned that from his family. And we also know that Paul had taught him. And so again, even though that's different for every person, there's a reminder for us that often the most important teachers to be passing on God's word are going to be parents and teachers. Right? Those are the the people normally that God puts in place to have a great impact uh, on people. And again, it's not always the case. It doesn't always work that way. But probably a lot of the times, those are going to be the most important people. And so, again, that's a reminder for us already as we start. So, and, and we think about if you are in a teacher or a parent role, there's something here for you to think about, right? How am I passing that, that good news on uh, to the next generation? He continues, though, and then we we come to one of the several uh, very important verses here in this section. He says, all right, so you you know from whom you learned it, and you know how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So again, this is just half of one sentence, but we kind of got to slow down and kind of pick apart a couple of the words to, to think about this. And one of those, first of all, is, is infancy. Now, again, this is talking about Timothy in particular, where we know his mother and grandmother had a lot to do, the, do with this, but he had heard God's word ever since he was a baby. 
And it's just a reminder that that's a great blessing when that's able to happen. You know, are there people who only hear about it later as an adult and then become believers? Yeah, that happens. And that's, that's, a, that's a great blessing when that happens too. Uh, but boy, it, it sure is neat when it's able to happen right away from when someone is just a baby. Uh, and, and what a blessing that is. It's one of the things we really expend the most of our efforts on as a church is doing that very thing. You know, it's why we have a school. That's why we have a faith night. Uh, we even send things to parents, you know, when after they have a baby, um, you know, before that child is school age, we send little things just to encourage them to be passing that on. Um, every once in a while today, you might hear, you hear people say occasionally, you know, I want, I want my child to, to make their, their choice, their, their thought about religion. They can decide that later in life. You know, and you hear that every once in a while. Uh, but this is just a reminder, when, when we're convinced that God's word is important, um, we're, we're very happy to pass it on to them as an infant. Now, does, does everyone continue in the word after that? No, unfortunately. Right, but, but what a blessing to be able to pass it on, you know, even while someone is so young. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a reminder right there. Uh, plus, now we get into, here's what this is good for. Um, the Holy Scriptures, again, another phrase for the Bible, are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That wise for salvation, that, that's one of the, my, my main points today. Again, thinking about continue in the Word. Well, the Word can make you wise for salvation. So there's a couple things for us to think about there. First of all, that word wise, we know that's a good thing. It's good to be wise. And, and sometimes we, we differentiate between being wise and smart. Um, and you could argue how, how, mu how, how much you really need to differentiate those two. But, you know, I've heard it said, uh, well, you know, being smart is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, but being wise is not putting the tomato in your fruit salad. So you might have to think about that a little bit. But, but the idea is there's a little, they're a little bit different. Uh, that when you're wise, it's a little more than just head knowledge. It's, it's how does this fit? How does this go into practice? And so we're thinking about uh, the word making you wise for salvation. It's not just knowing the fact, how, how am I saved? Um, although that's part of it. The word tells us we're saved by Jesus. We're saved not by our actions, but we're saved by what Jesus did. His life, his death, his resurrection that did everything we need, and, and God gives us the faith in it. In fact, God uses his word, and other parts of the Bible spell this out for us, God uses his word, and the Holy Spirit works through that word to put that faith and strengthen that faith in our hearts. So it's not just that it contains the truth, which is true, but it actually, the truth is powerful in that word to make us believe it. Again, the, the little furniture directions might have told me how to do it. They do not empower me to do it right, right? They, they might show me the steps to take, but if, you know, if, I don't, if I can't find the tools mentioned, if I can't, I'm still in trouble. But God's word actually gives what it's talking about. It gives that faith. And it's able, you know, I, I put the can make you wise, and it says in the, in the verse here, which are able to make you wise for salvation. And, and that's a reminder, does everyone ever who hears the Bible become a believer forever? No. Some people hear it and never come, become a believer. It's always an amazing gift from God when there's a believer. Uh, and and we th we're thankful that he, he gives that gift very freely, that, that gift of faith. But it it's not a guarantee, and so it's, it's a great blessing, and it's something, you know, we want to put people in, in touch with the Word, because that's what God uses. And so, you know, we can't control everything, it's up to God, but we want to put someone, you know, in, in touch with God's Word, because it is able to make you wise for salvation. And then the reminder at the end, that's through faith in Christ Jesus. Wise for salvation is not, oh, now I know how to save myself. Now I can be really smart and do just enough to get myself to heaven. Well, no. None of us could be that wise because we were born sinful. 
already from when we were born, it, it would have been too late to, to make it that way on our own. We needed Jesus, right? And it's only through faith in him. Again, that faith is exactly what the word works in us and strengthens in us. Right? So this is a huge part of why we would continue in the word is because God used it to, to give us faith and he uses it to keep that faith in our hearts, that wise for salvation, rescuing us from our sins, giving us eternal life in heaven. Right? But it's not just for those things. It's not just for eternal things. It's also for things that are, that are happening right now. And that's what uh, the rest of our section really gets into. And I'll just read the, the last two verses, and then we'll kind of go back. It says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, and I'm going to use that, that equipped word here and just kind of put it this way. The, the word lets you be equipped for life. Um, now, to talk about equipped, maybe it's not a word we use a lot, um, but if for whatever reason it had me thinking of, you know, there's certain things where we have a lot of equipment for, and that's because you need to use different tools of that equipment for a specific task. And, and the, the example I have, and I'm not really a golfer, um, I got to learn a little bit, but so if you've seen someone golf, whether you're a golfer or not, they carry a lot of clubs. And sometimes you might wonder, why, why do you want to carry that gigantic bag around, walking around in the grass and the sunshine all day, and this is a heavy thing, and now you've, how many clubs do you have in there? But you realize, or you come to realize as you learn how to play the game, is that, well, each club is a little bit different. And they're designed to, you know, either launch the ball more, more upward or more outward, depending on how far you need to go. And so, you know, if you're, if you're on the tee and you're trying to go a long way, you know, the, the, the one wood or the two wood or whatever it is, uh, I, might, I may be betraying how little I know about this, but, you know, you use those to go farther. And then when you're closer up, uh, or, you, you know, or you, if you're in the sand trap, or you, you, there's a different club that you use in different situations. And God's word, we're told, is like that, where different situations in our lives, there's different ways that God's word can help us and is useful at that particular point in our lives. And that's what we see uh, here in this, in this section. First of all, we're reminded that all scripture is God-breathed, which is a weird word, um, it's the only time the word in the original language there, it's the only time it shows up in the whole Bible. Um, God breathed. And it, it might seem strange, but the point is there that every word of the Bible, God was behind it. Yes, there are human authors that God used, but, but sort of like God breathed into Adam at the very beginning, the breath of life, well, God breathed into these human authors the exact words that he wanted to be written down in the Bible. And so um, sometimes we call this inspiration. Uh, we even get the word, you know, breathing, you know, breathing we think is respiration normally. Well, inspiration is breathing in, right? God breathing in exactly what he wanted to be there. And so that's a neat reminder for us when we think of the Bible that the Bible comes from God. So we don't have to worry. Yes, there's, there can be different translations where people try to take the original language and make it more clear. But the the message of the Bible doesn't go out of date or doesn't say, oh, we got to change this around because this doesn't fly nowadays. It might not fly nowadays sometimes, different parts of it, but it's still what God says. And so that, that's a great comfort for us because we never have to wonder, wait, is this one of those verses that's still true or is this one of those verses that's not true anymore? No, they're all true. Right now they might be applied in different ways and things like that, but we remember that's from God. So if there's a promise this is from God. This isn't just human beings saying this. Uh, and that, that can be a great comfort for us when it comes to how we trust what God is saying. But then, like I said, it's useful. Um, it's useful, like, you know, taking the clubs out for a specific shot in golf, a different club would be useful in different situations. God's word can be the same way. So it's useful for teaching, right? There are some things that, you know, I had the math book and the, and the reading little reading thing up there earlier. Yeah, there's some things that you'd, you'd teach math about and there's some things you would teach reading, but God's word, there's other things that we would teach. How God wants us to live our lives. What God wants us to know about our Savior. What God wants to tell us about his love for us. Those are the things we teach from his word, right? Um, and, and it's very useful for that. 
Uh, also useful for rebuking. Now, that's not a word we use a ton. Uh, but when you rebuke someone, you're telling them they're doing something wrong. Or you're telling them, stop that. Right? And, and that's really important. Um, you know, you might think, and again, maybe we think of a small child reaching for a, for a stovetop that they don't realize is on. Or like an online video I saw, someone reaching for a curling iron, uh, not realizing that's very, very hot. Uh, when someone does that and you shout no at them, you are rebuking them, uh, but you're also doing it for their, for their good, right? You don't want to burn yourself on this, and so you're going to tell them no. And, and God's word is, is used much the same way, where God tells us things to do and not to do, and so there's, there's time to rebuke someone who's going in the wrong path, which could, again, lead them away from their faith and lead them away from their Savior. So it could be very urgent, to tell them not to do. And so that's a very important tool that we would have in God's word. Uh, correcting is sort of the same as rebuking, but you know, sometimes people say, well, I know what you're against, but what are you for? Right? Like, uh, it seems like we always hear the negative, right? But what do you want me to do? Well, God's word has plenty of that, where it's not just don't do this, it's instead do this, right? And there's lots of examples, and the Bible is full of these things, uh, to, to help us to see what the correct way is and to correct our, our sinful path because we're still sinners and we're all going to need that. This isn't just for little children. This is until the day we die, we're going to need correction and to be put back on the right path. And the Bible is full of those things. And then again, training in righteousness. You know, if you're training uh, like uh, Olympians uh, in the recent Olympics, you know, had to train to get to the point for athletics, well, in righteousness, it talks about living out our faith. We need training too. We don't do it right the first time. We need to keep hearing again, no, you know, don't do this, do this. And again, this isn't just for little kids. This is for all of us as we grow in our ability to apply God's word. So again, God's word is useful in all these situations. Uh, and, and again, not every individual situation has a verse specifically about that. But it's, you know, we get better at applying how God's word fits to different situations. And it's a blessing to be able to do that. And again, it's a reminder, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right? So that whatever comes up, we know, okay, as a believer, how do I handle this situation? And again, that's hard. That's, it takes a lifetime of growth and, and practice in this to to improve at this, and it's still sometimes at the end of the day, it feels like, man, I still don't know what I'm doing with this. And so we're thankful that we have God's word, right? So God's word isn't just there for, well, you need it for heaven, but if you're healthy, you know, you can wait to open it until you start getting sick or something like that. No, it's something for our whole lives. It's very important, and that's why we're saying today, stay in the word. Right? It's the bread of life that God uses to feed us spiritually and build us up in our faith. We need it so that we can be, like we said, wise for salvation, right? to know how Jesus saved us, how he rescued us from our sins, but we also need it to be equipped for whatever situations God throws at us in our lives. And there'll be a lot of them. And his word is going to be important as we figure out, how do I respond how do I live my life in this world? Not just let, to be like everybody else, but to be like God wants me to be. To be responding to God who loves me so much, now I want to serve him in return. Now I want to thank him with everything I do. And what a blessing then to have that word to go forward with. So again, that's my encouragement for you. Stay in the word. Amen. I invite you then to please stand. And this time we will confess our faith in the triune God and we do that today using the words of the Nicene Creed. So I invite you to say these words along with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. 
for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you may be seated. We'll continue then with our responsive prayer of the church. Uh, and we also have a few uh, special prayers to add to that also. Uh, we're going to have a prayer for Jane Tarks, um, who had been hospitalized previously this week with, with some kidney issues. Uh, we're thankful now that she is out of the hospital and back home, but we're going to um, pray that God would continue to be with her as she receives uh, care for that issue. Uh, we're also going to pray for Good Shepherd member Rick Zaroff, um, who had to be hospitalized uh, late last night, I believe, uh, ask that God would continue to be with him. Uh, we're also going to pray with uh, for Lauren Benz. Uh, Lauren is the brother of Good Shepherd members Ross Benz and Becky Malashevsky. Uh, Lauren is having lung cancer surgery on Monday, uh, so I'll ask God to be with him there. And then also a, a prayer for our new teachers that are going to be serving in our elementary school. Uh, three of them, Maddie Abel, Katie Goldberg, and Becky Robbie, um, who are being installed in the, the late service today, so we'll pray for them and for uh, the work of our school in general as it uh, gets going this week. So we pray that responsive prayer. Eternal Father, your word is a lamp for our feet and a light to our path. You inspired the scriptures for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that your servants might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You have given us your word that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we may have life in his name. Enable us to see the wonders of your love in Christ from the beginning to the end of your holy book. Work in all your people, especially in parents, the resolve and patience to teach little children the simple truths about the Savior who loves them. Walk with us as we take our children to the manger, the cross, and the empty tomb. Let them find Jesus in stories, songs, and prayers. Provide wisdom and commitment to teachers who train our young people uh, in Sunday schools, faith night, and youth Bible classes. Deepen their knowledge of your word as they prepare and share the lessons they teach. Move them to model a sincere devotion to the scriptures. We thank you for enabling our congregation to provide elementary and secondary education for our children. We know our schools are your special blessing, and we pray for the resolve to establish and maintain standards of excellence in all aspects of education. Move us to be generous in our offering so that teachers may teach and students may learn in fitting surroundings. Yes, provide Christian schools Bless the schools and teachers who prepare public ministers of the gospel for service in our churches and around the world. Lead teachers and professors to be faithful to your word and provide insights that enable them to pass on your truth to their students. Ignite the zeal of young men and women to be willing and eager to share the truths of Scripture with others. Move us to support with our prayers and gifts the schools our Synod has established. We pray that you send workers in your Work in us that we may find the lasting value of growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Lead us to be faithful in our personal study of the Scriptures and in participating in regular Bible classes. 
Rid us of all thoughts that Christian education ends in our youth. Make us lifelong students of your precious word. And you alone, Lord, have the power to provide healing to those who are sick. We entrust to your care all who suffer from illnesses and disease. And we ask you to be especially with Jane Tarks in her time of illness. We thank you for being with her while she was in the hospital this week. If it is your will, restore her health quickly so that she may serve you with renewed strength. We also ask you to continue to be with Rick Zeroth as he is currently in the hospital. Be with those caring for him and according to your will, restore his health as well. Lord, you give great skill to doctors and other medical professionals, and you have allowed them to be able to perform surgeries and fight illnesses that would have been nearly impossible in the past. We ask you to grant skill to the surgeons taking care of Lauren Benz as he has lung cancer surgery tomorrow. Be with him, heal him according to your will, and keep him focused on your love and care for him in Christ. And Good Shepherd of the Sheep, we thank you for the ministry of Good Shepherd Lutheran School as its faculty and staff work to nurture the hearts, souls, and minds of your precious lambs. Bless the partnership between teachers, parents, and caregivers so that students are well-equipped to give an answer for the hope they have and serve their communities in love. We especially ask you to be with our new teachers, Maddie Abel, Katie Goldberg, and Becky Robbie, who are being installed today. In everything they do, help teachers and students fix their eyes on you so that they may run with perseverance the race marked out for them. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. Even when we are old and gray, lead us to meditate on your decrees that we may delight in your wonderful deeds. Amen. So we'll continue at this time with the offering. While the offering is being gathered, I invite you to fill out the Connect card that you find in each row. And those viewing us online can fill out the online connect card also. Thanks. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock, until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death, and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated. Those coming to the Lord's table, we invite you to come at the direction of the ushers. Come for all things have been prepared.
Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. It's great to be with you here today to praise our God together and receive his gifts to us and his word and sacrament. A couple of announcements for you this morning. Uh, last week, uh, last Sunday evening, we did issue a call for an associate pastor. We called Pastor Stephen Luchterhand. Um, he currently serves at Trinity Lutheran Church in Manaqua, Wisconsin. Um, and he did write us a letter acknowledging that he has received the call, so I'll just read that for you. Um, Dear members of Good Shepherd Lutheran Church, uh, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us, 2 Corinthians 4. Through your congregation, the Lord Jesus has issued a divine call for me to serve as a pastor in your midst. I am grateful for this opportunity to consider how I may best serve the Savior and his people. I am humbled, too, by the grace of our God that he continues to use such fragile jars of clay to proclaim his mighty word. Who is sufficient for these things? Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God, 2 Corinthians 3. It is a privilege to serve in the gospel ministry of Christ. I ask for your prayers and patience as I deliberate the two divine calls that our gracious Lord has given me, the one to your congregation and the call I currently hold to serve as people at Trinity Lutheran in Manaqua, Wisconsin. In the name of Christ our Lord, Pastor Stephen Luchterhand. Uh, so definitely keep him uh, in your prayers. Um, those who want to reach out to him uh, will be able to do so. I think we're going to send some of that information in the weekly updates. Uh, I know he's, right after he got the call, he was going to be on vacation for like a week plus, so um, it's probably okay that it's been a little time, and uh, then we'll be able to start reaching out to him once he's back here. Uh, the other announcements, um, just, uh, just to mention again, though, those newest teachers are getting installed at the second service today, uh, so keep them in your prayers, and uh, you know, look for them in the yeah, you know, if you're not here later, look for them in the coming days and, and weeks and, and get to know them. Madeline Abel, Katie Goldberg, who was around this congregation for a long time, uh, and Becky Robbie also. Um, there is also going to be a special reception after the service today. Um, with that, please greet those around you. Uh, greet someone you know and someone you don't know if possible. Uh, but above all, um, continue in the word. Uh, rejoice that God has given, given you that word for the next life. Uh, but also useful for this life, and we go ahead with that word. So thanks. We'll see you again.